So let's say you decide to buy a house. You hire a realtor, the realtor shows you the house, and then he or she gives you a number, 500,000. How do you think she came up with that number? She didn't do an intrinsic valuation of that house. She basically came up with that number looking at other houses in the neighborhood that had sold in the recent past. That is the essence of relative valuation. In relative valuation, you value an asset based on how similar assets are priced. In contrast, in intrinsic valuation, you valued an asset based on its cash flows, growth, and risk. The two are obviously interconnected, but they're not always going to give you the same answers. Most analysts who do valuation do relative valuation, and many of them do it badly. In this session, I hope to take you through a four-step process to make sure, if you use relative valuation, that in fact, you're dotting your I's and crossing your T's. So we've talked a lot about intrinsic valuation, right? And I don't blame you for thinking about intrinsic valuation as the only way to value a business. I like intrinsic valuation. But in this session, I want to introduce you to the technique that most people use to value businesses, which is relative valuation. What is relative valuation? Well, here are the basics. In relative valuation, you value an asset based not on its cash flows, growth, and risk, but based on what similar assets are priced out there. If you use StubHub to buy a ticket, or eBay to buy something, you're doing relative valuation. You don't try to value the asset, you look to see what other people are paying for something to decide what it's worth. In the context of valuing assets, here are the three pieces you will see in a relative valuation. First, you'll see a standardized price. What do I mean by that? Let's say you're buying a house. A five bedroom house will cost you a lot more than a two bedroom house. So rather than compare the prices of houses, we look at price per square foot, so first you have a measure of standardized price. Second, you have a set of assets that you call comparable. You're saying these are similar assets that I've traded and these are the prices they traded at. And I would put quotes around the word similar because there are probably differences. Even if you try very, even if you're very careful about your choices, you're probably still going to see differences. And the third step is if you're careful, you control for those differences. So there's a standardized price, there are comparable assets, and there are some ways of, comp of controlling for differences across assets. That is the essence of relative valuation. If you've ever read an equity research report, you know what I've just described, right? The standardized price usually takes the form of a multiple. The similar assets are usually called comparable firms. And the controls are usually storytelling. But that's relative valuation. Now, before I delve into relative valuation, I should also tell you that relative valuation is pervasive. It's all around us. In fact, to show you how pervasive it is, I'll give you a couple of statistics. About a decade ago, I collected about 550 equity research reports from around the globe, different investment banks, different equity research houses. I must confess, I didn't read most of them. I collected them because I wanted to categorize how equity research analysts approach valuation. Out of the 550 equity research reports, about 45 were discounted cash flow valuations, less than 10%. About 450 were relative valuations, a multiple and comparables. The remaining 55 were kind of fuzzy. I couldn't quite categorize them. But among the ones I could categorize, 10 to 1, relative valuations outnumbered discounted cash flow valuations. I took a look at about 100 acquisition valuations, hoping or expecting things to be different in corporate finance. Out of the 100 acquisition valuations, I got, got a much more even split. About half were discounted cash flow valuations, half were relative valuations. But then I took a closer look at the half that were discounted cash flow valuations, and I noticed that in most of them, the biggest number, the terminal value, was estimated using a multiple. So even those were really relative valuations. Almost every rule of thumb you see out there is based on a multiple, right? What am I talking about? Price to book less than one is cheap. A price earnings less than 10 is cheap. They're all based on multiples. What I'm trying to say is the language of valuation around us is the language of relative valuation. So when I first ran the statistic, I was a little puzzled by my finding. And here's why. When I teach my, my valuation class at NYU, I always end every class with a question. And this is after everybody's valued their companies using multiple approaches, discounted cash flow valuation, relative valuation, whatever other approaches they might use. So I asked them at the end of the class, after they've tried these approaches, if they had to pick an approach, which one they would pick as their preferred valuation approach. In the 25 years I've taught the class, I get pretty much the same answer. 
about 70% pick relative, discounted cash flow valuation or intrinsic valuation, reflecting, I guess, my biases. About 20% pick relative valuation. About 10% I'm not quite sure. So 7 to 2, when people leave my room, they say they're going to use discounted cash flow valuation. I haven't done a follow-up follow uh, questionnaire. But if I did a follow-up question five years later and asked these people on their jobs, I don't know what jobs they're at, what approach do you use to value companies? I'll wager the numbers get switched. That 70% use relative valuation and maybe 20%, maybe, still use intrinsic valuation. So I started thinking about what it is about relative valuation that makes it so attractive to analysts. And I've come up with three possible answers and feel free to add to this list. The first one came to me while I was watching a Seinfeld episode. One of those episodes where one of Jerry's many girlfriends accuses him of being crazy. He says, Jerry, you're crazy. He says, if you think I'm crazy, you should see the guy who lives across the hall from me. And if you've ever seen a Seinfeld episode, you know who lives across the hall from Jerry, right? It's Kramer. And relative Kramer, who's crazy? You saying, what's this got to do with relative valuation? We forget how much your valuation is selling, right? So if you're trying to sell me something, it's far easier to sell me something with a relative valuation than an intrinsic valuation because here's all you need to do. You need to find something even more overvalued than what you're selling me. You say, look, it's cheap. It's cheap relative to these five other things I found out there. Relative valuations are far easier to sell than intrinsic valuations because as long as you let me pick the multiple and you let me pick the comparables, I can tell you whatever story I want to tell you. Second, it's far easier to defend a relative valuation than an intrinsic valuation. And here's why. In intrinsic valuation, your assumptions are all explicit. Everybody can see what you're assuming about cash flows and growth and risk, and that's dangerous because they can pick it apart. In relative valuation, all your assumptions are implicit. So when you use 12 times EBITDA, you are making assumptions, but nobody can see what those assumptions are. And if they cannot see them, how can they pick them apart? And third, and this is something that we don't factor in enough when we think about valuation. I personally think in the long term, you're far more likely to be right with intrinsic valuation than relative valuation. But here's the catch. When you're wrong with intrinsic valuation, you're also far more likely to be wrong alone. You're saying, so what? If you're wrong alone, you tend to be fired. If you use relative valuation and you're wrong, you're always going to have lots of company. And that's a safe place to be. The survival instinct kicks in. And that's why I think more people use multiples than intrinsic valuation. Even if you're a true believer in intrinsic valuation, here's my advice to you. Understand relative valuation. Keep it in your arsenal. It doesn't have to be an either or. I am a true believer in intrinsic valuation, but I still do relative valuation. I'll often frame my intrinsic valuation in terms of relative value. So don't give up on relative valuation. So let's talk a little bit about how we can bring relative valuation into our toolkits. Before I talk about the four basic propositions or ways in which you can prevent yourself from making mistakes with relative valuation, let me first go back and talk a little bit about multiples. As I said, to make comparisons across companies, you've got to use a multiple. And every multiple is a numerator and a denominator. And here's the way to think about it. In your numerator, you al almost always need a measure of market value. That market value can be just of your equity, that's market cap, as is the case with price earnings ratios. It can be market value of equity plus the value of debt, which is the market value of the firm. It can be market value of equity plus debt minus cash. That's called enterprise value. So in almost every multiple, you're going to see one of those three numbers, market cap, value of the firm, or enterprise value. The difference between enterprise value and firm value is enterprise value is net of cash. So it's firm value minus cash. In the denominator, you can see one of four measures. You can see revenues because you're, you're wary about accountants and what they can do to the bottom line numbers. You might see earnings, earnings per share, operating income. No, you might see even measures of cash, cash earnings, EBITDA. You might see book value, book value of equity or book value of the entire firm. Or you might see some sector specific measure. What am I talking about? Remember the late 1990s when dot-com companies were compared based on value per website visitor? You can compare steel companies by dividing the market value by the number of tons of steel they produce. But basically, it could be some measure of operations, market value per employee, market value per unit output. But in all of these measures, what you're trying to do is you're trying to scale market value to some common variable. 
That's the first step in relative valuation is to get a sense of what those multiples are. Because I'm going to take you through a four-step process that if you're religious about following, you're going to be okay with relative valuation. Because my problem with relative valuation is not that people use it, but that they're shorty about the way you, they use it. And here are the four steps I'm going to go through. I'm going to start off by defining the multiple. I don't mean to be insulted. You're probably saying, I know what the PE ratio is. I know you do. But your definition of PE and my definition of PE might be very different. I'm going to describe the multiple. Sounds fancy, right? But I'm going to use STAT 101. I'm going to put up a histogram. I'm going to count the number of companies with PE ratios between 0 and 4, 4 to 8, 8 to 12, put it on a distribution. Because the distribution is going to tell you some very interesting statistical things about multiples. Then I'm going to analyze the multiple. I'm going to argue that embedded in every multiple are all of the assumptions you made in discounted cash flow valuation about cash flows, growth, and risk. I'm going to make your implicit assumptions into explicit assumptions. And only then am I going to apply the multiple. Define, describe, analyze, apply. In too many cases, you see analysts trying to apply a multiple without going through the first three steps, and that's what gets you into trouble. Let's start with defining the multiple. When I look at a multiple, there are two basic questions I ask. The first question I ask is, is this multiple consistently defined? Let me explain. As I said, every multiple has a numerator and a denominator. If your numerator is an equity value, your denominator has to be an equity value as well. If your numerator is a firm or an enterprise value, your denominator has to be a firm or an enterprise value as well. You have no idea what I'm talking about, right? Let me back up. Let's take PE ratios. Think of what's in the numerator. It's a market value of equity, right? And in the denominator of earnings per share, which is well, equity earnings divided by the number of shares, which is okay. Thank God for small blessings. The most widely used multiple in the world is consistent. Or EV to EBITDA. In the numerator, you have market value of equity plus debt minus cash. A rough measure of the market value of the operating assets in the company. And in the denominator, you have earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. A rough measure of operating cash flows, EV to EBITDA is okay. So here's what's not consistent, a price to EBITDA ratio. And here's why it's not consistent. Your price is a market value of equity. EBITDA is, a, is an operating cash flow. You say, what's wrong if I use it and I'm consistent? I use it for all 15, 20 companies in my sector. It's still, it's not, it's still it's not going to work. And here's why. If you have companies that borrow a lot of money, let's say they borrow money to buy back stock, the market value of equity will drop, right? But their EBITDA will not be affected by the borrowing. Those companies are going to look cheap to you. If you mismatch your numerator and your denominator, you use equity value in the numerator and you use a pre-debt value in the denominator, you're going to find companies that borrow a lot of money look cheap to you for all the wrong reasons. So check your multiple to make sure it's internally consistent. Second, make sure it's estimated exactly the same way for all 15 companies in your sector. It's actually a tougher test to meet than it sounds. If using price earnings ratios, here's what I'm asking you. Is earnings per share estimated exactly the same way for all 15 companies? That doesn't just require that you have the same accounting standards, right? You need all companies to have the, equal, the same amount of fidelity to those, those accounting standards. If they don't, aggressive companies are going to look cheap to you. So watch out. Second step in the process, describe the multiple. As I said, this is basic statistics. When you have a lot of data, put it up in a distribution. Because what you're going to get a sense of when you put up this distribution is what's high, what's low, what's typical. One of the things you're going to see when you put up the, the histogram, and you're going to see a few in the next few sessions of each of these multiples, is none of them is symmetric. Why? Because a multiple can never be lower than zero. A price earnings ratio cannot be less than zero, but it can be 15,000, 20,000, 25,000. You're saying, so what? When you have a distribution where the lowest value is zero and the highest number could be any number, your averages are going to get pulled out by those outliers. I remember what my stat professor said in my first statistics class. He said, if you have an asymmetric distribution, a distribution where the outliers are all on one side, he said, trust the median, not the average. So we'll look at the statistics of these distributions, but it's good to look at the data. 25 or 30 years ago, you could have had the excuse of saying it's too much work. That's no longer true. Today, we have the data to look at, and there is really no basis for rules of thumb if you don't have the data to back up those rules of thumb. So that's the second step. Look at the distribution. Make sure that the distribution meets your characteristics. Third, 
analyze the distribution. As I said, embedded in every multiple are all of the assumptions you make in discounted cash flow evaluation. Assumptions about cash flows, assumptions about growth, assumptions about risk. So there are two questions you're trying to answer here. When I use a multiple, what are the variables that should determine that multiple? Second, how do changes in those variables affect my multiple? So for instance, if you tell me that the variables that matter are growth and risk, how does change in growth affect this multiple? You think that's going to be really difficult to do. Not really. Here's a very simple rubric you can use for finding out the variables that drive a multiple. If you have an equity multiple, price earnings ratio, price to book, go back to a very simple equity valuation model. The simplest one I can think of is a dividend discount model, a stable growth dividend discount model. The value of a stock is the expected dividend next year divided by the cost of equity minus the growth, right? Divide both sides of that equation by a constant. So for instance, if I divide both sides by earnings per share, I end up with an equation for the price earnings ratio. That'll tell me what the variables are that drive the price earnings ratio. If I have an enterprise value multiple, go back to a very simple enterprise valuation model. Enterprise value is free cash flow to the firm next year divided by cost of capital minus growth rate. Do the algebra. As you will see in the coming sessions, that's going to allow us to come up with the variables that drive each multiple. And once you have those variables, the rest becomes straightforward. You can control for differences. You can look to see why some companies are cheap and others are expensive. So define, describe, analyze. And if you go through these three steps, then you're ready to apply. And when you get ready to apply, there are two basic questions you have to answer. What am I going to call comparable here? What are those comparable firms? And the answer might seem simple. You might say, I'm a software company. It's other software companies. But that's not necessarily the truth. A comparable firm from a valuation perspective is a company with similar cash flows, similar growth, and similar risk. And guess what? If you're Microsoft, none of those companies might be software companies. So think in fundamental terms and think of ways in which you can control for differences on those fundamentals. Storytelling is not going to be enough. So one of the things we're going to talk about in these coming sessions is how to control for differences in ways in which it goes beyond the storytelling. So let's review. Most people use relative valuation and most people use it shortly. So if you're going to use multiples and comparables, and I think it's a good idea to know how to do it at least, even if you're a believer in intrinsic valuation, remember the four-step process. Define the multiple. Make sure it's consistently defined and uniformly estimated. Describe the multiple. Think of its statistical properties. Look at what's high, what's low, what's the median. Analyze the multiple. See what variables drive this multiple. And only then should you use that multiple in application.